Okay, everybody. Get out, just like last week. Get out the prayer to the Holy Spirit, unless you have already memorized it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of us, your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so you may remember, you may have talked about in the small groups at the beginning, Last week we talked about what it means to be a spiritual person, and we talked about how, in many ways, what a lot of people mean by that now is the opposite of what it actually means. We, how a lot of people mean spiritual to mean kind of vague, somewhat unreal, somewhat kind of ungrounded in anything, but what we mean by spiritual person, when we use that term, is we mean somebody who is very grounded, somebody who's very grounded in the, like, the core of reality itself, right? Which is God. God the unchangeable in the middle of a reality that, it is, that is very changeable. And like I said last week, if you know, the past five, six months have taught us anything, it should be that reality is very changeable around us. You know, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen next week, what's going to happen next month, we really don't know for sure. And so we need to kind of, it's, it's wise, it's smart, and it's really necessary for us to cling to something unchanging. And God is the one thing that is unchanging, unchanging and unchangeable. We talked about how the sacrament of confirmation, when you receive the sacrament of confirmation, the bishop prays over you, the bishop anoints your head with the chrism on the forehead there and says, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, at which point you are filled with the grace of the Holy Spirit, with the very presence of the Spirit of God, which of course makes you a spiritual person. It gives you that kind of that, that, that relationship between you and God. We also talked about though how the sacraments, none of the sacraments, including confirmation, are magic in the sense that it won't do all the work for you. It's not going to do all the work for you. You need to kind of cultivate that. You need to use those gifts, practice the use of those gifts, if they're to be of any use to you or any use to anyone in the world. And so we talked about that's the reason why we have these classes so that you can understand, in a sense, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what they are, what it means to practice your faith. Because again, it's not something vague, it's something very concrete, what it means to practice your faith. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about next week, um, kind of some, some, some things to do with that. But, but you have to know what this practice is so that the grace you receive during confirmation, the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to do something with those. You'll be able to function as an adult in the church, as we put it, although that's a strange kind of way of phrasing it. And so this week, we're going to kind of build on that. Like I said last week, too, each one of these classes, they're going to build on each other. And so, what we're going to build on this week is, it's another term. Like I said, it's like spirituality or spiritual people. Not only do people misunderstand what that means, but we kind of tend to think of it meaning the opposite of what it means. We're going to talk this week about love. Because very often, we mistake what love is. And we get that, just like we do with spirituality, we get it not only wrong, but precisely backwards from what love means. The way we use the term love very often is very often in, in terms of an emotion. 
I feel a certain way. This person, this thing, this place, whatever it is, this song, this, this piece of art, this TV show, whatever it is, makes me feel a certain way. And so we say, I love that thing, or I love that person, or I love this food, or whatever, because it makes me feel good. Now, there are a number of problems, apart from just that just being not what love has meant throughout all of history, there are a handful of problems with that, especially as we discuss Christianity and being a Catholic, right? Because God, Jesus, tells us in the Gospels that the greatest commandment is to love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says also elsewhere that we're supposed to love everyone, our neighbor is everybody, including our enemies, including people we don't like. Now, if we hear that, then we can begin to see the problem, the difficulty, that how can we, first of all, be commanded to feel a certain way about anything? That's kind of a strange thing. It's very hard to make ourselves feel a certain way. If there's something you don't like, you kind of don't like it. Right? And it's really hard to kind of change your emotional response to something. Right? If you wake up, and we've all, I think, done this, if you wake up in a bad mood, let's say. Well, you just wake up in a bad mood, you're not feeling good, whatever it was. Maybe you had like a weird dream or nightmares, or maybe, you know, something bad happened at the end of the day before, and you didn't really, and you're still kind of upset about it, or just whatever reason, you sometimes wake up, you're in a bad mood. There's really, it's hard to do something about that, isn't it? Sometimes you might wake up in a good mood. Sometimes you might wake up sad. Sometimes you might, you know, your emotions are kind of things, I like to say, emotions are things that happen to you, right? You might be in a good mood, you might be in a bad mood. And, and so God doesn't really command us to feel a certain way. He doesn't command emotion from us. What God commands us to do, what Jesus commands us to do, is to do certain things. Either to do certain things or to not do certain things. All right, we get a kind of a, a kind of a, a little bit of a key or a little bit of a hint of what it means, what love means, and this is what we're all kind of moving towards. In the Gospels, Jesus says too that you are my friends if you do what I command you, if you keep my commands, and that gives us a hint of what love is, because love isn't an emotion. Again, how could we? feel a certain way about everyone, especially if we think of love as kind of like, you know, the feeling that you have if you, like, say, fall in love with someone. You get really excited to see somebody, you know, or somebody that you're just very close friends with and you like to see them and you're excited about seeing them, and that's love, and you have to feel that way about everybody. Just walking down the street, you go to the grocery store, you have to feel that kind of love, that emotional response to every single person that you run into. Well, that's kind of crazy and definitely weird, and it would be weird if you felt that way about everybody. Love isn't an emotion. Love is a choice that we make. It's a decision that we make. It's an act of the will, as we put it. We can choose to love or not love. If I'm in a bad mood, I can still choose to love or not love. If I even don't really like someone, I can still choose to love them or not love them. Love is a decision that we make. All of morality, really is about decisions that we make, the commandments and everything else. And so, when Jesus commands us to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, he's not commanding us to feel anything, he's commanding us to do certain things. To act in a loving way towards God, and to act in a loving way towards our neighbor. So, what is this way? If that's true, and that's what love has always kind of meant. You know, up until fairly recently, historically, if you use the word love, this is what, what you mean is what I'm talking about. Not kind of romantic love or affection. Affection is the word we'd use to describe the emotion. Or, and so, what is love? Love is, if we want to go to a very, very, very old definition of what love is, but still a pretty good one. Love is to desire the good of the other and to work towards the good of the other. 
to be willing to not only work towards the good of the other, but even sacrifice for the good of the other. And you start to see, if you understand love in that way, we start to see why our conception of love right now is so backwards, right? Because my, our conception of love now, it's all about me. It's all about us, right? This person, this place, this thing, whatever it is, makes me feel good, and so I love it. But it's all about me, right? But that's not what God is telling us to do. He's not telling us to focus in on ourselves. God wants to focus in on other people. And so it's not about the way this person makes me feel. It's what am I willing to do for this person? Am I willing to love this person? Am I willing to not only desire good things for them, but am I willing to work for their good? To do good things so that their good can come about, even to the point of sacrificing a little bit for myself, right? When, you, when I use the word charity, most people would think giving money to the poor. That's charity. Or giving, you know, if there's a food drive, giving, you know, canned goods or whatever it is to helping the poor, right? That's charity. Well, charity is just another word that means the same thing as love. And so why do we call giving food to the poor charity? Why do we use that word? Why do we use the word love? Because it's an act of love. It's because if I take $5 and I give it to the poor, what am I doing? Well, I'm sacrificing a little bit, you know, for somebody else's good. Because I could use that $5 for anything. I could use that $5, for, you, know, you know, to buy something or that'll, that'll make me happy, that'll benefit me somehow. Or I can sacrifice this, you know, whatever it is and help someone else. To sacrifice a little bit from myself for the good of another. Loving acts are things that we do all the time, and maybe we don't think of it that way, but we should. Sometimes we sacrifice a little bit. You know, if you ever, you know, somebody's coming behind you and you see them coming and maybe they're carrying something and maybe they're not, and you hold the door open for them. And it takes you five extra seconds, right? Okay, well you sacrificed five seconds for the good of someone else. Now, it was a small sacrifice and it was a small good, but it was still an act of love. Now, there are greater sacrifices for greater goods, right? And so, but, but this gives us an idea of what, it is, what love means, is it means to seek the good of another person and to be willing to sacrifice for it. And so now all of a sudden, if we look at the greatest commandment, to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, well, what does God desire? What does God want? God wants us to worship Him. God wants us to honor Him. God wants us to follow the commandments. And so if we love God, we'll do that. And if we love our neighbor as ourselves, well, what does that mean? How do, we, how do we love our neighbor as ourselves? How do we do that thing? Because there are a lot of competing kind of visions in the world. How do we love one another? And a lot of contradictory things, but God has helped us out with this too. Remember I said earlier that we get a hint of what love means when Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. That seems kind of like a strange thing to say. Say, you're my friend, but you have to do whatever I tell you to do. Okay, but that's not how Jesus means it. How Jesus means it is the commandments from God are all about love. All of the, all of the morality, the moral code of Christianity is how do we love God and how do we love one another? That's why we should be moral, because we should be loving. And morality and lovingness are the same thing, effectively. And so, just as an example, let's take some of the Ten Commandments, right? We know the Ten Commandments, hopefully. We're at least aware of them. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not worship other gods other than God. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, right? We can look at it as just a list of things that we do and don't do. But there's another way to look at it too. If we add a couple words to it, I think it starts to make more sense. So if you say, if you love God, you won't take his name in vain. If you love God, you won't put other gods in front of him. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you won't steal. If you love your neighbor, you won't kill. You know, and that makes sense, doesn't it? 
If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to steal something from them. If I steal something from you, it means that I love the thing I stole more than I love you. And it's hard to argue that if I murder someone, that I loved them. You know? And so, the commandments or the description of how it is that we love God and how it is that we love one another. And so that's why morality, and like I said in the, in the binder, morality is something kind of, we don't really want to talk about it, it seems kind of like a heavy thing, but that's why morality is a very serious thing, but it's also a very concrete thing again. Morality is more than just my opinion. I say the commandments, the, the teachings of the church, all of these things, they're more than just, like I said, if, we, if I talked about sins, right? The following things are sins, and I made a list. Well, it's not that those things are just a list of things that annoy me. There are a lot of things that annoy me that aren't sinful. They're not just a list of things that annoy the bishops or the pope or whoever it is. It's sins are things that separate us from the love of God. Moral things are things that bring us closer to the love of God. It's how we manifest the love of God in the world. That's why morality isn't just an opinion. It's because we receive it from God. Because God, remember in the Bible, says God is love. So God is love and we're supposed to love. So God has given us these things to teach us how to love. And so morality isn't my opinion. And morality isn't something, you know, kind of heavy that's imposed on us from outside, but rather is the fulfillment of love, which is why we were created in the first place. So in a sense, in that very real sense, morality comes from God. It has its origin in God, and it's only really possible to love if we are in that relationship with God, who is the source of love. Because you know, as well as I do, that sometimes it's hard to love other people. It's hard to love other people sometimes, especially if they've hurt us, especially if they've wronged us or somebody that we know in some way. It's hard to desire the good for somebody sometimes, and it's certainly very difficult sometimes to be willing to sacrifice ourselves for the good of someone. You know, because we're instinctively, we want good things for ourselves, right? Of course we do. You know, that's human nature. It takes a little bit of effort. It takes a little bit of kind of strength of will to be able to step outside of ourselves and to sacrifice for the good of another person, especially when that sacrifice starts to be a little bit kind of, you know, bigger. You know, not the sacrifice of five seconds to hold the door open or five dollars to, you know, buy somebody lunch, but sometimes the sacrifices are really big. Last week when we were talking about responsibilities, if you remember... I talked about, you know, how as we grow up, we kind of take on more and more responsibilities. That's part of what growing up is. And I talked about, you know, eventually most of you will be responsible for another person, for a child, you know, in a family. Well, you think about, you know, the sacrifices that parents make for their children. You know, it's a lot of sacrifice, a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money, you know. You know, to buy food, shelter, clothing, and education for their children. That costs a lot of money and no small amount of time. But why do they do it? Out of love. Those are big sacrifices. Why are the, the catechists who are here in this room, but also teaching in the rooms down the hall, why are they here? It's a sacrifice of love. It's several hours of time. They're not getting anything out of it. Directly, I mean that I'm not paying them. You're not paying them. But they're here because they care about you and they're willing to sacrifice a couple of hours for your good. Right? Sometimes it can be hard, but it's worth it. Because I want you to imagine for a minute a world where all that most people are concerned about is their own happiness. I'm concerned about my own happiness, and I'm willing to use you to make me happy. And I love you as long as you make me happy, but if you don't make me happy, you're gone. I don't care about you anymore. You know, I put you aside. Imagine a world like that. We don't have to imagine that hard. That's more or less the world we live in. A lot of the time, anyway. You know, that's why we see violence. That's why we see theft. 
That's why we see people lying. That's why we see all of these kind of things when we turn on the news. That's why we see all of these horrible things because most people are geared towards getting what they can out of other people and then moving on. But imagine for a second, imagine a world like the one I kind of described with love, where people actually loved one another, where people were looking out for the good for the, of, of the other, not just desiring the good for the other, but willing to sacrifice for the good of the other. That's all of a sudden a nicer world, a much better world. Because in a world where everyone is selfish and looking out for their own good and their own happiness, for, for happiness, it's me versus eight billion people, right? Me versus eight billion people, and I'm going to use them to try to make me happy, and they're going to use me to try, to try to make them happy, and we're in kind of competition with each other, always. But if I'm worried about the happiness of other people, and other people are worried about the happiness of me, then all of a sudden, it's not me versus eight billion people, as I've got eight billion people on my side. All of us working together. All of us willing to sacrifice for one another. All of us desiring the good and willing to work for the good of the other. All of a sudden, it's a much nicer world. Now, we can't cause that to happen, in a sense. You know, we can't bring it, we can't change this room full of people. We can't change eight billion people. But there's some things we can do. We can change ourselves. We can, by the sacrament of confirmation, by our living as an adult in the church, in that true spiritual sense, by that interaction that we have with the God who is the source of all love, we can change ourselves. And if that's all we can do, then maybe that doesn't change the world, but it's a pretty good start to seek out the happiness of others, to seek out the good of others, to be willing to sacrifice for that. And we can start to change the world a little bit. Again, we can start to change the world a little bit, make it a little bit better, make it a little more loving, make it a little more charitable, as we'd say. And bring God to other people and bring ourselves closer to God too. What a wonderful thing that is. And so we, are, we should be very pleased, although not everyone is, that we have, by means of the church, a way to know what is loving and unloving, a way to know what is moral and immoral, it's the same thing. A way to know what it is, because like I said, it's not always easy, not only to work for the good of another person, but it's not always easy to know what that is, right? Now, of course, the greatest good for another person is salvation, eternal life, right? to bring about that greater good of eternal life. And so that's why it is a great act of charity to pray for other people, an act of love, right? You go, you pray for someone else. You pray for their happiness, you pray for you know, their success, you pray for their salvation, the forgiveness of their sins. You know, that's why we read in the, in the Church Fathers very often, you know, if you see someone sinning, go pray for them, because it's an act of charity to pray for them, to bring them closer to God, to closer to their greatest good. So that's the greatest good, and there are other goods along the way. Food, shelter, clothing that people need. And education, friendship, kindness, all of these things. I say there is no difference between morality and love. They're the same thing. And so the church helps to guide us, because again, we can get confused, because there's a lot of things there's a lot of competing things in the world, and it's not always clear. It's not always clear what it is, what the right thing to do is, what the good thing to do is, either for ourselves or for other people. So the church guides and the church helps us, and so we should give thanks to the, for the, that the church is there, that God has given us the church to help guide us to know what is the good. And so for now, we want to break into small groups for a little while. Um, I will come back here. Well, I will we'll, we'll break for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll have some announcements, and then we'll have uh, the rest of the talk for this evening. Thank you.